God's grace, his mercy, and his peace to you, dear brothers and sisters. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I suppose if you were asked about prayer, you would probably be able to tell people something or, something or another about it. After all, we are the Christian church. Certainly, we understand what it is to pray, yes. We understand that prayer is a gift from God, according to God's word. And yet, we somehow, some way forget there is nothing in us, fallen and sinful people, that makes any of us worthy to approach the throne of God in prayer, and there is no reason why Almighty God should lend his ear and listen to us. And yet... Our loving Heavenly Father bids us come, and he has promised to hear us when we pray. What else is that other than pure grace and pure gift? Prayer indeed is a gift of God. But when we consider what the Word of God declares of prayer, do we regard it as a gift of God? Or do we disregard it? not praying as we should, putting it off, doubting it's good, or even being bored with it. Do we really, do we really have more important things to do? Some people might think so. When gifts that we give are received with such little appreciation, we stop giving them. But still, God bids us come. God calls us and has promised to hear us in our prayers. What else is this other than pure grace, pure gift of a loving God to us? Yes, prayer is, is indeed a gift of God, but how do we pray? For prayer is not natural for fallen and sinful humankind. Prayer does not just rise up spontaneously from our hearts. The sin in our hearts makes us want to be independent, not dependent. We want to help ourselves. We don't want to ask for help. And so, the word of God is clear to us, we must learn to pray. Uh, that's why books on prayer, books of prayer, are constantly the best-selling in Christian bookstores around the United States and the world. Oh yes, we know we need to pray, but really, do we know how? Too often, we don't know how to pray. Have you found yourself at one time or another wondering, if prayer is supposed to be so easy, why does this seem to me to be so hard? Oh Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. This was the request of the apostles before Jesus, asking Jesus, teach us to pray. Just as John did with his disciples, teach us to pray. A good rabbi would do this, to teach his students how to pray. And how sweet those words must have sounded in Jesus' ears. His disciples were learning. They were learning how much they did not know. How much they needed to be taught. How great, truly great, their need. And so Jesus eagerly teaches them. But notice that Jesus gives them two things that they need to pray. Number one, the word of God. And number two, the promise of God. Jesus does not direct his apostles or us to go into our hearts as the basis of our prayers. The struggles of doubts and fear and death are found right there in our hearts. The very things that keep us from prayer, oftentimes making us even angry with God. Instead, Jesus gives us what we need, the gift of prayer. He gives us the words, and he gives us the promise that our prayer will be both heard and our prayer will be answered by our loving Heavenly Father. And by so doing, Jesus teaches us something very important about the Christian life and the life of prayer. That Christians 
walk into the future by walking backwards. You heard me correctly, that Christians walk into the future by walking backwards. We see what lies ahead by looking back. For looking back into the word of the living God, looking into the word of God and the history of God's people, we see constantly the faithfulness and the goodness of God. We see God's work and forgiveness. We see God's leading and God's guiding. We see God's judgment and restoration. We see God's strength and his love. We see God's promises kept and God's abundant patience and mercy. We see God's constant care and protection to all his people of every generation. And so looking back, we walk forward by faith born of God's holy word knowing that what we see in the past is what awaits our future. For our God does not change. And here we have the example of Abraham we read in our Old Testament reading today. Now he prays in faith, walking into the future by looking to the past. He knows that God is merciful and that God is gracious. For the God who spared eight righteous persons in the ark and did not destroy those righteous ones with the wicked in the flood will not now destroy the righteous with the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the God who just promised Abraham a son within a year and that he would make him the father of many nations would not now turn a deaf ear to Abraham. And so Abraham is bold to pray. For his prayer is not based on himself. Abraham's prayer is not based on his heart. But his prayer is based in the faithfulness and the goodness of the loving God. And God doesn't tire of hearing such prayers. But God graciously listens, patiently listens. He doesn't chide Abraham. He doesn't rebuke Abraham for his bartering with him. But rejoicing in Abraham's faith. For God never tires of the prayers of his children. Yet here perhaps is where we fail and why we struggle with our prayers. For rather than walking into the future by looking to the past history of God, we turn it all around and we try to walk by sight, our own sight, instead of by faith. And then, when we do that, two things happen. First, we take our eyes off of the very faithfulness and goodness of God, and thus the source of our faith and the source of our faith's strength, God himself. And second, we put our eyes instead of on a future that we cannot really see and which is uncertain and unsure at best, and often downright scary. We begin to look at the circumstances around, and we begin to sink in the power of its weight. For we see how miserable and how perilous life in this world truly is. Consider what Martin Luther had written when he was describing the petitions of the Lord's Prayer in God's Word. He describes it this way. It is a world of nothing but blasphemy of God's name, disobedience to God's will, rejection of God's kingdom, a hungry land without bread, an existence full of sin, and precarious sojourn, and an abounding in every evil. Wow. Seems like he wrote it in 2016, yes? And facing and looking at such a future. Should we be surprised that our prayers fail as we look at the circumstances all around us? As we look at the faithlessness of others who are supposedly Christian? Our fears increased. Our hearts tremble. We are filled with all sorts of wondering, all sorts of doubt. Should we be surprised that we wonder where God is, what he is doing, and whether God really loves us or not? Should we be surprised that so many are confused? But turning around and looking at God's faithfulness by looking backward to the faithfulness of God, what is it that we see? We see the very same things on the horizon, but we also see the faithfulness and the goodness of God in the midst of those very things. The presence of Almighty God with his people. 
The promises of God made and the promises of God kept. And thus, looking back, our faith is not weakened, but our faith is strengthened, and our prayers are emboldened, for they are firmly grounded in the Word, the Word of the living God. They are firmly grounded in the promise of the living God. And here, perhaps, we have a little bit of an advantage over Abraham. For while Abraham was bold to pray that God would save those cities for, for the sake of ten righteous ones, it's almost comedic the way Abraham continues to drop the number. Just, how about ten faithful, Lord? How about that? Abraham was bold to pray that God would save those cities for just the sake of ten in Jesus we see the true grace of our loving God. God's grace that does one even better. For in Jesus, we see the grace of God that saves the world for the sake of one, one righteous person, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. For into this world of sin, death, and unrighteousness, the righteous Son of God came to save all from sin, to save all from death, to take the fire and the brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah upon himself, upon the cross, that we might be spared of destruction, that we might be spared of the very destruction that we deserved, and then to rise to life again, that we would have life in Jesus, life and a future a future secure in the word and the promises of a living, loving God. That word and that promise of God was given to you in the waters of holy baptism and made you a child of God in the forgiveness of your sins. A child of the living God, that's who you are. And so every time we pray, our Father, as Jesus has bid us to do, every time we pray, our Father, we do so looking back in faith to that day when God became our Father and the promises of God were given to us in those beautiful waters and God's Word which enable us to walk into the future strong in Jesus Christ. And every time we approach this altar to eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we do so looking back in faith to the cross upon which this body and blood hung and the forgiveness, and the life, and the salvation won by Jesus upon the cross is given to us here and enables us to walk in the future strong in Christ. And thus, forgiven, strengthened, we can pray with confidence, a confident faith. And yes, for our Lord knows what he is doing. Our Lord clearly knows. Even when you don't know what it is you're doing or where to turn, our Lord knows. For the deadly poison of the hellish serpent and the scorpion, he has taken care of. He's placed it on himself, the person of Jesus, who now gives us his food and drink and all that we need. And while walking into the future, walking backwards, may seem kind of foolish, part of being a Christian is to understand this. To be a Christian in the world today may look pretty foolish. You can't look tough when you're down on your knees. You can't look tough to the world when you're turning the other cheek. You will not be considered the intellectual if you believe and insist of what God says that the bread and wine are truly Jesus' body and blood. You will not be considered smart if you continue to believe what God says about you, that he cares for you and he loves you, that he hears you and he answers your prayers when you don't get any results, but that he is answering and that he is there and that he is loving you. The world will say very clearly, oh, there is no power in prayer. Now think about it. They're right, aren't they? There's no power in prayer. The power is in God. The power is in God, in the person of Christ for you. Prayer is our response to that power of God, our confession that we trust in the power of God, that we trust in the merits of Jesus Christ and him alone, and that we do not live by sight 
experience or reason or our feelings, but that we live by faith. We live by the faith that God has richly given to us. Faith born from every word. Faith born from every promise that comes from the mouth of God. Not from the fickleness of our hearts. Not from the fickleness of our turning our backs. But from the very mouth and the holiness of a loving God for us. So when my life and your life is full of the I don't have time, Lord, teach me to pray. When the demands of this life have left my heart emptied and dried up, Lord, teach me to pray. When I'm filled with grief, filled with pain, Lord, teach me to pray. When I'm confused, when I'm in doubt, when I'm lost, when I'm uncertain, Lord, teach me to pray. When I want to go it my own way and do things the way I want to do them and have you put your blessing on my actions, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Teach me to turn around and know that my Father hears. For God, not you, God keeps his word always. Always. God will provide. God will forgive. God will deliver. I am his. You are his. The gift of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of Almighty God, which surpasses all human comprehension, Guard and protect our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.